Please turn with me for our scripture reading this afternoon to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew 1, just a few verses this afternoon as we consider um, the Catechism's explanation of the name Jesus. Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, where Jesus, um, or Joseph, is commanded very specifically to call the name of Mary's child Jesus. Matthew 1, starting at verse 18. And here again we have words that are penned under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Our song of preparation is number 491. Number 491, let's rise to sing all the stanzas of Jesus, the very thought of thee. Please also turn with me in the back of the Trinity Psalter hymnal to page 876 and 77. 876, as we look this afternoon at the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 11. Page 876. And in question 29, and this is a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches, of course. We're asked, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? Our answer, because he saves us from our sins, and because salvation is not to be sought or found in anyone else. Question 30, do those who look for their salvation and security in saints, in themselves or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? We answer, no. Although they boast of being his, by their actions, they deny the only Savior, Jesus. Either Jesus is not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept this Savior have in him all they need for their salvation. 
Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the questions that I often ask when I do baby visits, when I visit with couples who have just had a baby, maybe a few days after, one of the questions that I often ask is about the name of the baby. And this comes after the more obvious questions. Was dad in the delivery room? And did he, keep on his, did he stay on his feet? Um, how is he liking spit-ups on his clothes? And has he been uh, changing diapers? Questions like that. Once I get those out of the way, I get to, so the name of the baby is Hudson. Uh, the name of the baby is Easton. Where, uh, how did you guys come to that? And sometimes uh, he or she, the baby, is named after a relative, as we have this afternoon with uh, uh, Keith and Morris. Um, other times, um, it's just a name that the parents happen to like, or sometimes, you know, uh, there's a search to have a kind of a different name. Well, in Bible times, uh, children were named very specifically, and they were n what they were named said something about them or quite often predicted something about them. Take, for instance, the name Isaac. We know that the, um, Sarah named her son Isaac, meaning laughter, because he brought laughter to her, having a child in her old age. Uh, Edom means red, because when he was born, he was, fire, he was of a fiery red color. And Perez, as we've said before, means uh, to break out. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning break out, because he kind of pushed ahead of his twin brother. And so he was named after, um, in honor of, uh, what, uh, of his birth, I should say. Well, we're looking this afternoon at the name of our Savior, Jesus. At the specific name that was given to him. And this is the name that was designated to the one born to be the Savior of the world. His name, Jesus, was deliberate. We heard in our scripture reading that Joseph was told very specifically to call the name of Mary's child Jesus. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins. And the name Jesus is the English translation of the Greek, Jesus, which is derived from the Hebrew, Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. And so in the name of Jesus, there is the idea of salvation, deliverance. And so when the Son of God took to himself a human body and nature, he also took a name or this name for himself, Jesus. When we read the gospel accounts of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension, we hear him specific, specifically called Jesus. And when the apostles write about him, this is the name that they use, Jesus. Paul writes just a few examples in 1 Corinthians 12 that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. John testifies in 1 John 5 that whoever believes in Jesus is born of God. In Hebrews 2 verse 9, we read that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. James calls himself a bondservant of Jesus. The book of Revelation speaks of those who were martyred for the sake of Jesus and ends with the longing cry of the church, even so come Lord Jesus. And so to us, his redeemed church, the name Jesus is the name above every other name. And that's why Hudson and Eastern today bear the name of Jesus upon themselves. Our uh, theme as we look at the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 11 this afternoon is this, the church confesses the blessed name of Jesus, Savior. The church confesses the blessed name of Jesus, Savior. We'll see in the first place that Jesus saves us entirely, and in the second place, he saves us exclusively. But as we confess the blessed name of Jesus, Savior, we see in the first place that in doing so, we're confessing that Jesus saves us entirely. In question 29, we're asked, why is the Son of God called Jesus, meaning Savior? And we answered, because he saves us from our sins. And so when we confess that we believe in Jesus in the Apostles' Creed, what exactly are we saying? What are the implications in confessing the name of Jesus? Well, we're saying that Jesus saves us, that he is the only Savior. Well, saves us from what, you ask? He saves us from our sins. The implications are very simple, yet very deep. We're confessing that we need saving on the one hand, and that whatever we need saving from is really, really bad. Now, let's talk about first why we need saving. 
Well, first of all, the biblical concept of saving, every time the, the word is used in the Hebrew language or in the Greek language, uh, uh, the words that are translated saving or delivering, has to do with rescuing someone from a hopeless situation, from a situation that is absolutely hopeless. The sense of the Hebrew or the Greek words uh, translated saving or salvation is that the one who is being saved cannot help themselves. We are lost. We are doomed. We have no hope of escaping or fighting ourselves out of the mess that we're in. We are powerless against our adversary. We are caught in the net. We are snared in the trap. The sentence has already been pronounced and the sword is about to fall. Biblically speaking, to need saving does not, does not mean that we still have some fight in us. That we, need, we just need some assistance because we, we can't hold off the enemy by ourselves. It doesn't mean that. It does not mean that we merely need a leg up or a hand up or a rope thrown to us so that we can pull ourselves up out of the water. It doesn't mean that either. To say that Jesus saves us means that he performs an essential work, an irreplaceable work, an incomparable work. He rescues us in our helplessness and our absolute hopelessness. But from what does he save us? Does he save us from pain merely, from illness, from aging, from money troubles, from miserable neighbors? No, he doesn't save us from any of, this, of these things. He saves us, more importantly, from the thing we need to be saved from more than anything else. He saves us from our sins. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Apostle John describes sin as lawlessness. And so sin is any act of rebellion against God's law or against God's commandments. Every time we go against God's commandments, we are sinning against Him. And the sad thing is that by nature, we are constantly in a state of sin. The fact is, apart from Jesus, our situation is a lot worse than we normally imagine. We actually come into this world already born bearing the stain of original sin. That is the sin that we inherit from our parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And it's a, original sin is a guilt that we bear upon ourselves even from conception. As David tells us in Psalm 51 verse 5, original sin comes because Adam stood as our representative in the Garden of Eden and he fell into sin at the instigation of the devil bringing guilt upon himself and all his children. And so original sin, we might say, is the reason why all of mankind is so corrupted. We're tainted. We're, we're broken. There's something wrong with us. Something that causes us to be pulled in the direction of sinful things all the time. But it gets even worse. This original sin with which we're born is the source or the fountain of all uh, our what is called actual sins. Bubbling out of our sinful hearts are wicked thoughts, words, and deeds. As early as Genesis 6, we hear that God saw the greatness of man's wickedness on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And so like an inherited disease, we are all, every one of us, depraved by nature. Paul says in Romans 2 that because of our stubbornness and unrepentant heart, we actually store up wrath against ourselves for the day of God's wrath. Now, some of us may hear this and, and they may say, well, well, come on now. It's not really that bad, is it? Really? Let me ask you this. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Do not worry. Do we get anxious? Do we worry at times, which shows our mistrust of God? Or do we trust God completely all the time so we never are anxious, we never worry? The Bible says that uh, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger be put away from you. Can we say that we are free from bitterness and wrath and anger? The Bible says that among you there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Can we say with a straight face that our eyes, our speech, our thoughts are absolutely clean all the time? Boys and girls, do we lie sometimes? Are we disrespectful to mom and dad? 
Do we lose patience with people? You think sometimes we're secretly jealous of other people? How good are we at forgiving other people? The point is, sin saturates or permeates our entire being. And yet, in Christ, we may confess that we are saved entirely. The Catechism says that Jesus saves us from our sins. That's almost a direct quote from Matthew 121. The name of Jesus doesn't merely identify him. It speaks of his mission. It speaks of his purpose in coming in the flesh. Why did he come? To snatch us like burning branches from out of the fire. In Isaiah 53, in that great, marvelous, wonderful, suffering servant passage, in Isaiah 53, we hear these words prophesied of Jesus many, many years before his birth. Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Son of God came to fulfill this prophecy, to bear our sins, to suffer sins, consequences, and to save us from the wages of sin, which is death. Jesus saves us entirely. We confess that there is no sin in our lives that is so great that if we truly trust in Jesus, we will ne never hear him say, even I can't help you with that one. There is no sin so great in our lives that we cannot be forgiven through Jesus. There is not one sin in our lives that is left uncovered when we come to believe in Jesus. In 1 John 1 verse 7, we hear that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sin. That's marvelous news to all who grieve over their sins. When you see these failings and shortcomings in yourself, when you, you see, you look at yourself honestly and you think, I can do better, I should do better, I should love others more, I should do more. Why am I so, uh, I hold a grudge for so long? Why am I so slow to forgive? When we see all of these things in our lives and we, the Bible calls that hungering and thirsting for righteousness. When we see these things in our lives and we hunger and thirst after righteousness, Jesus says to us, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And Jesus promises us rest from the weariness of our sin, which is the greater burden, or the greatest burden that we carry around in this life. He promises us relief from the heavy burden of our guilt, because deep down inside of us, every one of us, whether we want to deny it or not, we know that we are guilty before God because of our sins. Jesus promises relief from that burden. He promises to lift it up off of us. He promises the removal of our fear of death, which again is the greatest fear that we have in this world, death. Jesus promises to remove that fear, and uh, he promises to remove the fear of eternal condemnation in hell, which again, everyone knows in their hearts is true. Jesus saves us entirely. Through Jesus, we are justified in the sight of God. That is, we are made righteous in the sight of God. All our sins, yesterday, today, and forever, are covered. No longer do we need to try, like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to cover ourselves with fig leaves. We may wear the garments of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Through Jesus, we may know that we are reconciled to God and that the promise of eternal life is ours now as forgiven sinners. But as we confess the blessed name of Jesus, Savior, we also see in the second place that Jesus saves us exclusively. In the second part of, question, of answer 29, we confess that salvation is not to be sought, sought or found in anyone else. Now, what do we mean when we say that Jesus saves us exclusively? We mean that salvation is found in none other but Jesus Christ and in Him alone. We're declaring 
that every other way that men suggest is a false way. Every other system is, is a lie. Every other voice, every other path, every other method leads only to death. Only Jesus is the way to life. Now, that's not exactly politically correct to say today. A lot of folks would hear us say that and they would be appalled that we would dare to say things like that. But remember, we're only confessing what the Bible says. We're in fact confessing what Jesus himself says, what the apostles said and taught. I'll give you one example. Um, in Acts 4, verse 11 to 12, in Acts 4, verses 11 to 12, we have John and Peter confessing this in the early days of the church. This is the stone, speaking of Jesus, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now in Acts 4, John and Peter, as you might know, were challenged by the Jewish religious leaders. And they're called before them and told, basically, you guys better start playing nice. You better stop all this nonsense and rocking the boat and don't mess with the good thing we have going on here. Don't make waves. Stop all this nonsense about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, Peter and John, in the power of the Holy Spirit, of course, were not about to back down even an inch. They stood up to their opponents, which was a tremendously difficult thing to do in that day with the religious leaders of uh, Israel and they stood up to their opponents and they declared that Jesus was an exclusive Savior to the uh, exclusivity of every other Savior. This Jesus, they said, who had been crucified had been raised from the dead. This is the evidence that he was the Savior sent into the world by God. This Jesus, by whose power they had just healed a crippled beggar, was the stone the builders had rejected. And so salvation was not to be found in Moses or Abraham or Elijah, but in the name of Jesus. This was the exclusive claim of the early church. And it has to remain our exclusive claim today. Again, we're not making this up. It's not something we came up with on our own. We're following the teachings of, teachings of the early church, of the Bible, and of Jesus himself. I mean, if someone says, how dare you say that, you could very well say to them, look, your argument is not with me, it's with Jesus himself. It is he who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we didn't say that. Jesus said it. He lifted himself up, exalted himself as an exclusive Savior. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. And by these words, we have to understand that Jesus severed all ties with any other religion or philosophy. And this is where we continue today to part ways very strongly with every other teaching of salvation. In Jesus, we confess, we have the narrow way, the single path, the only access to God the Father. No other work but the work of Jesus, no other blood will do, no strength but that which is divine can bear us safely through. And so it is indeed futile. It is useless to look for salvation elsewhere. Think about it. Where can we find a Savior who is very God of very God, who became truly human, divine so that he may bear divine wrath, truly human so that he could pay for the sins done in the flesh. Where can we find another Savior like that? Where can we find in all of history a Savior who was perfectly sinless, who could keep all the commandments of God perfectly, and he did this on our behalf? Where can we find a Savior who understands our weakness because he himself was tempted in every way as we are, yet him, he himself never sinned? Where can we find one who loved us so much that he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man, humbling himself even unto death on the cross? Where would we find one so self-denying that he gave his very life as a ransom for us even while we were yet sinners? Where can we find such a savior? 
congregation, there is no other name. There is no one who transforms or reforms or renews like Jesus. There is no Savior like Jesus whose love, power, and perfection is sufficient to meet all our needs. And so we must ask this question, verse uh, number 30. Do those who look for their salvation and security in saints, in themselves or elsewhere, really believe in the only Savior Jesus? We have to answer no. Although they boast of being His, by their actions they deny the only Savior Jesus. Either Jesus is not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept the Savior have in Him all they need for their salvation. Written in the 16th century, this question was needed in light of the practices of the Roman Catholic Church from which the Protestant Church had broken away from. And it still remains a question that is valid today. The teachings of the Roman Catholic Church have not changed. And again, still today, it's not that they replace Jesus or they completely put Jesus out of the picture. What they do is they add to his work as if he needed it. They require the worshiper to pray to saints and in the Roman Catholic Church, what they mean by saints is uh, men or women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, who they consider super holy. Those are saints in the Roman Catholic Church. And so they require the worshipers, the church members, to pray to these saints. And they encourage you to perform penance, which involves reciting uh, the Lord's Prayer and, and Hail Mary's a specified number of times. And so you go to the priest, you confess your sins, and he says, okay, I hear you. So go home and pray the Lord's Prayer 10 times and the Hail Mary 20 times. That's your penance. That's how you will be forgiven. And they recommend not eating certain foods at certain days and times of the year. And they call you to, and there's a certain amount of obligation that's put upon the members uh, to give financial gifts to the church. And so they certainly, when you examine the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, we may say that they certainly look for the salvation in saints, in themselves, and elsewhere. But you know, we can't be content this afternoon with merely criticizing the Roman Catholic Church. We also have to ask, do these tendencies lie in us? Remembering the words of the prophet Jeremiah, who said that the heart, that is our hearts, are deceitful, above all things, and desperately wicked, who can understand it? And so sometimes, quite often, we can't discern our own hearts. It takes a, a lot of prayer and a lot of growing in our faith for us to begin to see the idols in our own hearts. And so we too have to watch ourselves that we don't fall into the sin of adding to the work of Jesus. One of the most frightening passages, at least I think so, in the Bible is Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 where we hear Jesus say these words. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and then done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The sad thing, the sad reality of what the Bible teaches is that many will weep and wail and gnash their teeth on the day of judgment when they realize that the things that they trusted in were really additions to the work of Jesus and it was not solely Jesus that they trusted in and they will try according to what Jesus here says here they will try to argue them their way out and to debate, debate the point, and they will say, but Lord, I went to church every Sunday. I went twice every Sunday. I supported Christian education. I gave to the causes that the deacon sent before us. I had my children baptized. I did everything that I was required to do. But you see, unless we have confessed in our hearts, honestly and sincerely and genuinely, Unless we have confessed in our hearts, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Unless we have confessed that in the name of Jesus, we have all we need for salvation. Unless we are trusting in Jesus alone and showing by our lives and our choices that he is all we need. Then we are building on perishable material. 
to be saved does not mean that we have done certain things dutifully. It means believing and trusting that we have in Jesus all we need for salvation. We cannot add to the perfect work of our Savior. Now, Paul gives us the grand example in Philippians 3, verses 4b to 9. Philippians 3, verses 4b to 9. Paul says, If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But then he goes on to say, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And if anyone ever, in all of history ever had something to boast in, to trust in, it was the Apostle Paul. He possessed everything that was prized by the religious leaders and by the religion of his day. Breeding, education, zeal for the law. And yet, when he came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he looked at all of this and he saw it as useless, as garbage. And he turned his back on all of it for the sake of Christ. And he saw by the Spirit of Christ that his works, his lineage, his enthusiasm produced nothing but a misplaced self-righteousness. And perhaps we don't trust in these things. But we always have to watch ourselves that hidden in our hearts would be a trust in, in the church I belong to, the practices of my church, the traditions of my church, my own faithful efforts, my own obedience. There's always that danger that we are secretly trusting in these things rather than in faith in Christ alone. And so every day is a day to remind ourselves that Jesus saves us adequately. He doesn't need our help. We don't need anything or anyone in addition to Jesus. And as we raise our baptized children, this is the most important thing that we need to teach them about the Savior, Jesus. And we need to lead them in word and life to the only source of true joy and peace, the Lord Jesus. The world, of course, is going to offer them and us a multitude of choices. But when we truly understand our sin and the holiness of God, really, there is only one choice. There is only one name by which we are truly saved. And that name is the name Jesus. Father, help us to take these words to heart once again. Help us to see that we cannot add to the work of Jesus in any way. That we are wholly dependent on Him and upon His work. Keep us from anything that would distract us, cast down every idle throne so that Christ may reign supreme in our hearts and He alone. Cause us, O oh Lord, to understand and to see very clearly how great our sin is, and understanding this, and understanding that you are a holy God, that it is absolutely ridiculous to think that we can somehow work toward gaining your favor ourselves. Help us to cast all our anxieties upon Jesus Christ and to trust in him alone for salvation. Bless us by the work of your Holy Spirit this afternoon, that we may confess and believe and trust and be comforted by the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Number 492 is our song of application. Number 492, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas, or... 
Oh man, that's six stanzas. Um, yeah, it's a short one. Let's sing all six stanzas, uh, rising to sing. <laughs> 